I'm Ann Barbano of Life Stories. Tonight I have assembled four different people from the early 1980s that were on the Board of Aldermen. They were called the Board of Aldermen in Burlington. Now they're called City Councilors. And they're going to give us a little bit of a story about what was happening in the early 1980s, uh, coming in as a third party. The first person I'm introducing is Terry Baricious. He served from 1981 to 1991. Uh, the second person is Zoe Briner. 1982 to 1986. Gary, Rick Musty is 1982 to 1986, sorry Rick. And Gary DeCarolis, 1982 to 1986. Yeah. And I actually want to start out with Terry. Uh, okay. Terry, you became a Citizens Party candidate. Mm -hmm. And I read that you were the first national. Yeah, Citizens Party was a group that was founded in around 1980, I guess. Right. Barry Commoner was an environmentalist who ran for president of the United States, didn't get a lot of votes, but there's a Vermont chapter, Rick was part of it, um, in fact all of us were at mm -hmm. some point, point. <laughs> and uh, in 1981, along with Bernie Sanders, um, I got elected. It was to some extent a shock, I um, uh -huh. thought I had a chance, but I didn't think it would really happen, but yeah, so I was the first one nationally. Citizens Party has long since evaporated, um, and we evolved and left that name behind and reorganized eventually as the Progressive Coalition. So was Bird, Bernie was a Citizens Party candidate too? No, uh, actually he wasn't. He was just running as an independent, but you know, we were sort of, we worked together, uh -huh. but he was never uh, a member of that party. He had been part of the Liberty Union Party years before that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not when he ran for mayor, he was just running as an independent. So why did you choose to run? Gosh. Um, you know, I first got involved in local politics when I was a student at Middlebury College because Bernie Sanders came and spoke at universe at Middlebury College and he inspired me. It's like he was talking about things that most politicians were ignoring and he was talking the truth, you know, really getting at issues and, it, and I got involved with the Liberty Union Party back then and I'd run for things before. I mean, I was a political person. Mm -hmm. you know? I wanted to save the world and, um, and my neighborhood, both. And when I lived in Burlington, um, I'd run for the state senate and then said, you know, I did really well in the neighborhood right where I live. What if I run for the city council? Mm -hmm. And uh, I did and I won. I think for me, um, I was living here in the early 1980s, and I know some of the Bernie supporters were independents. They ran as independents. Did each one of you run as an independent, or did you have a, a title? Were you a Citizens Party? Were you progressive? Tell me a little bit about the history of how it became the progressive party. Well, the first time I ran, I ran on Citizens Party ticket. Um, I was never a political person. Um, I got involved because of my interest and concern with what was happening with the wood chip plant and oh, a Vermont Alliance organizer knocked on my door one day and uh, we organized a neighborhood group and did things like uh, get stop signs across the street from the park and mm -hmm. little things like that. But then the wood chip plant is really what inspired me to run. What but ward is this, Zoe? Ward 2. Mm -hmm. um, but I ran Citizens Party for the, for the benefit of the party organization and help in running the campaign because I had never done anything like this before. And the second time I ran, I believe I ran Progressive Coalition because by that time the Citizens Party was, was pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Rick? Um, same story for me. I ran Citizens Party the first time around. And then I think it was Progressive Coalition the second because uh, Citizens Party had vanished. Actually, I got interested through Terry. Uh, Terry and actually Ian Mascaris, uh, who was then a Citizens Party promoter and member. He dropped, was. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. he, uh, yeah, he inspired house, me as well. Uh, <laughs> dropped by my house one Saturday afternoon and, and to just talk. And uh, I had known Ian indirectly and not well before that. And uh, we sat in my, my living room and talked a little bit about it. And uh, I said, yeah, I think I'd like to do it. And subsequent to that, I uh, went down and and met Bernie in his office and we had a back and forth conversation to see if we had ideas and attitudes that were similar. Mm -hmm. And they were and we felt that, I felt that they were similar enough, he felt that they were similar enough. So then it was off to the races from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Gary? Hi. Well, in C Citizens Party the first time, although um, I lost my first election in 1981 when Terry and Sadie White uh, won. and. Um, but the reason why I ran was, too, my neighborhood was absolutely falling apart. It was not getting any city services or support. And 
um, I was involved in the old, it's called One Voice, the Old North End Voice at the time, and it was a group of people concerned, citizens of Ward 2 and 3, who really wanted to try to make a difference for, the, for our part of town. The other thing that motivated me at the time was John Lennon was, had recently been shot, and music and people saying those things that I thought were important to be said, upon his death I felt like, okay, it was time for me to step up to the plate to start mm -hmm. doing the things that I was hoping other people would do or had done for me in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the combination of both. Um, the interesting thing about my loss that first year is that I was running against Sadie. I hadn't done much outreach to see who was running and who Bernie was going to support. or, or And I didn't, I didn't know Sadie, really, at that time. I didn't know Bernie that time. at that time. Um, so we ran, and the, there was three of us, the Democrat, Sadie ran as a um, quasi-independent because she, she was bumped out at, as, by the party there. She was pissed off at the party. At the Democrats. At the Democrats. Yeah. And then I ran as a citizen's party. When the, we went to look at the votes on the machines, we were all within a few votes. Like, like it was like five, uh, 325, 330, 335. It was very, very close. Then they counted the absentee ballots. And the other two, each Sadie and this, the Democrat, had each had about 100. And I didn't know what an absentee ballot was at that point. <laughs> I had zero. <laughs> and so they went on, and I backed Sadie. And they, they had a runoff, and Sadie won. And then next year when I ran, um, Sadie backed me, and Bernie was supportive. And, and then I joined them. That first year with Sadie White and me as Bernie's only supporters on the city council was really a board of aldermen at that time. It was really something. Sadie and I would always drive to the meetings together because she wanted somebody to walk her to her car after the meetings. Sometimes I'd go on my own and she'd drive during daylight hours, but after the meetings I'd walk her back to her car and we she'd drop me home. We should mention Sadie was how old at this time? No one really knows exactly in her 80s, early 80s. A fascinating 80s. person. Yes, and she's still active today. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, she's been involved in, in politics and union activity, you know, for decades in Burlington. Very influential person. Um, and so it was basically Sadie White and myself with Bernie Sanders against the rest of the city council. And you have to understand, in those days, the city council had been dominated by the Democratic Party for so long. It's people, you know, we were just considered a fluke. And uh, they sat us on the opposite ends of the table so we couldn't speak to each other. And Bernie was at a table back there and we couldn't speak to him. And before then, there had been, let's see, what, uh, 11 Democrats so 11 and, and two, two Republicans. Right. Right. Terry, and excuse me, but who was doing the seating? Um, the, the president of the city council decides who sits where. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, it was um, Joyce Desitel's first year, but then she stepped down, and the replacement was um, Blanchard, I guess. <coughs> um, and anyway, so it was, it was very difficult because it was hard even to get, you know, recognized to speak. And, um, Why was that? Why was there so much animosity? I remember the newspapers mm -hmm. talking about the abrasiveness of the progressives. And well, Bernie's actually, the people. headlines at the time weren't about the abrasiveness of the progressives. The headlines at the Times were all about the stonewalling of the Democrats. Because uh, what happened is that the charter says that the mayor should make certain appointments, you know, city clerk, city treasurer, city attorney, and so on. So the mayor made those appointments, and the city council stonewalled and refused to confirm any of his appointments without any hearings any consideration of their qualifications. They said the mayor, well, they didn't even call him the mayor. Sanders' election was a fluke. We just have to wait him out for two years, right. and we're going to run this city. We're not going to let this interloper, the Bernie Sanders, run this, yeah. this the show. And so well, Bernie Sanders actually had to try and sue the city council just to get his charter given authority to make certain appointments. I mean, uh, it, was, it was an absolute well, conspiracy <coughs> to deny the mayor. And that really pissed off a lot of people. Mm -hmm. People organized a group called Citizens for Fair Play, organized, leafleted, had rallies. Um, and the upshot was that after a year of this, with the mayor basically having no administration, I mean, the first thing the city council did, Board of Aldermen, when Bernie got elected, the first meeting was to fire his secretary, who he had just hired. Um, that was the very first action mm -hmm. the city council right. ever did towards Bernie Sanders, and then refused to appoint him. So, after a year of this, where, quite frankly, public opinion was just the, the, the Democrats, they're just like, oh, forget it. They're just being outrageous. They're not letting, we elected the guy mayor, let him be mayor. And so the upshot was these three guys <laughs> got elected one right, year, a year later. later. Right. Yeah. When we came on, came on board, I think then they realized they had to take this election a little more seriously, especially because <coughs> uh, we defeated incumbents pretty, I, I defeated a Democratic lawyer 
you know, and... Uh, Who was that? Uh, Russ McCat. And <coughs> actually, I uh, defeated the previous president of the board and a woman, Joyce Desatel, mm -hmm. uh, who had been very popular and had quite liberal views as a Democrat. Uh, so it was really, in a way, surprising. I won by mm -hmm. 45 votes. And I can remember standing in the shower and hearing my son uh, yelling upstairs, you won, you won, you won, and I, was, I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> uh, after having stood out in the cold all day. Uh -huh. And the thing about you know how controlled the city was by one party, there was, I can remember standing on the polls that day, and people would walk by, barely give you any eye contact, and if, you had, if I was trying to get a sense of how good or bad I was doing by how people were looking at me or not, I, I wasn't going to win. And um, what was happening is they, were, they didn't want to show any sign to the other candidate, who was the Democrat, that they would be supporting me. Mm -hmm. So they just kind of walked in, walked out. In fact, a lot of them, they called our offices to pick them up, and they wanted to be left off around the school building and walk around so the Democrats didn't see that they were picked up by, by us to vote. Mm -hmm. They had literally abandoned the, the party, the Democratic mm -hmm. Party, in, in big, big numbers. But it was a very strange thing for them. And I don't very get the for animosity, us. though. Where was all this coming from? I mean, I mean, Republicans and Democrats still have worked together. Control and I, power, right? Yeah, I think I have one, uh, two kind of explanations. One was, actually came from uh, a Republican who sat next to me, who was a wonderful man uh, as a person, Bob Patterson. And Bob said he, he <coughs> been on the board for a long time and had been a member. And he said, you know, being on this board as a Republican, um, there have only been mm. two of us. There was nothing we could ever do, and they always shut us out and didn't allow us to bring forward any, uh, any legislation or really talk or be involved. And we just sort of hung in here because we were Republicans. <laughs> and I think that it's a classic case of a group of people that had had power since, I believe, 1952. Quite a while. Uh, and they'd gotten to the point where they were complacent, and they owned it, and they controlled it. Mm -hmm. uh, and one striking example of that was that uh, people who were Democrats, uh, and including high public officials, could borrow money um, from the, from the uh, retirement fund of the city at very low interest rates to um, go out and buy themselves a vacation home on Lake, right. on Lake Champlain. And that's one of the things that we called in. We called those notes. Uh, <laughs> they only had to they pay had the to interest. Pay up. And they only had to pay no, the interest. No, not, nothing they on the principal. The principal back. So I think that what had happened over years is people had gotten very comfortable with each other, and they mm -hmm. built relationships that were classic uh, sort of industrial military industrial complex <laughs> types of relationships you know if you stroke my back I'll stroke your back mm -hmm. and they felt like it was was breaking down under them and it mm -hmm. was political power was being lost the, the were you a different generation too not completely there were some very young people on there also mostly I would say we were younger mm -hmm. than the incumbents but well, there's a, what's his name Sweeney from Ward 4 had been the mm -hmm. youngest he'd been like a basketball right. star or something yeah, like that in the school, really and, high school and so there were some young people there also um, but it, I think it was one of the reasons there was so much animosity is we were sort of exposing the, the, the dark side of the Democratic Party. The, the establishment had, they were doing all kinds of just really, you know, inappropriate things. They, like the city's insurance policy, we discovered that they had this cartel of insurance companies that would analyze the city's insurance needs, write the policies, and then sell them to themselves. And the city council never put it out for bid, never examined it, the mayor never, and when we looked at it, put out for bid, save, you know, like 30%, 50%, something outrageous. Huge. And there were a lot of things like that. We discovered the city had a, a huge surplus in its fund balance. That they didn't that even know. They didn't even know about. The treasurer at the time was somebody who didn't even have bookkeeping experience when he was appointed. He was just a friend. I think he was like an education speech pathologist or mm -hmm. something like that. Wasn't an accountant. And he was the city treasurer. He didn't know how to keep books. And mm. I mean, you know, you go on and on, you find all kinds of stuff that was just, like, screwy. And when we started bringing it to light, it was very embarrassing for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think another factor, though, is that Bernie referred to himself as a socialist. And I think there was a great fear of what that meant and what was going to happen. And also because, uh, well, when we got on the board and uh, discussions opened up a little more, we started addressing world issues. At that time, the threat of nuclear war was much greater than it is today. And there was a lot of 
discussion around that and uh, mm -hmm. this whole mm -hmm. civil defense office mm -hmm. was boosted as, as a way to le legitimatize the mm -hmm. bringing the issue forward and um, but those early years we, I think really we accomplished more nuts and bolts kind of thing mm -hmm. like Terry said you know reforming the accounting system uh, establishing youths and arts offices and things like that which weren't really politically that exciting mm -hmm. but I think did a lot to uh, establish our credibility mm -hmm. as being able to run the city and to point out a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of things that that really were mismanaged mm -hmm. and in those early years we didn't have a you know that much clout on the city council but in fact progressive have never had a majority of the city council mm -hmm. but there were sometimes we were able to to back the mayor like I remember the, the trash incinerator <laughs> proposed for mm -hmm. the the intervale that uh, that had all gone through in the Paquette administration, the bonds were there, and they were ready to start construction, basically, and Bernie Sanders had to veto that. It would have been an incredible financial mistake for the city. It would have mm -hmm. destroyed the city financially, and also the pollution, obviously, and the people in the neighborhood mm -hmm. really were up against it. And uh, we were able, Bernie vetoed that, and we were able to sustain his veto. So we weren't able to actually do that many uh, initiatives that went through the city council. Most of the initiatives of those years mm -hmm. we did by Creating independent video. citizens yeah. groups, mm -hmm. the Women's mm -hmm. Council, the Youth Office, uh, Arts Council, Battery Park Concert Series, all those kinds of things were done. In a shadow government. In a shadow government yeah. because Bernie wasn't allowed to make his appointments mm -hmm. first. And then when he was, it's like uh, none of our initiatives could go through the city mm -hmm. council. So we sort of had to do mm -hmm. on the side of government rather mm -hmm. than with the government. But as I recall, I, it seems like we were able to cooperate <coughs> more with the Republicans on the board at that oh, time. Absolutely. They supported us our, on mm -hmm. uh, putting the insurance out to bid and doing some of the other things that, that we did. Right. I've always heard that. You worked better with Republicans. Yeah. Early on, right. Which yeah. surprises people so because they were the minority. It wasn't mm -hmm. their right? town either. It but, really was right. the, the old guard Democrats They city. saw it as a way for them to uh, Get in the fun. <laughs> I mean, if you look, if you look at the, the the makeup of those two parties, the leadership is. You, some people sort of maybe it's an oversimplification, but it's sort of like the Republican Party was sort of like some merchants and stockbrokers and that kind of Republicans. But the the ruling group that was you know sort of in power in Burlington were the people like the landlords and and uh, the small business people of other sorts. And it's sort of like they they were two different groups. I mean, it's mm -hmm. largely ethnic mm -hmm. French. Uh, and, and Irish mm -hmm. Catholic uh, Democrats and the Republicans didn't like them mm -hmm. um, and the reality is Republicans were into some of our good government proposals like the mm -hmm. insurance putting that out for bid mm -hmm. it's like, it just made perfect sense the Democrats mm -hmm. it was their friends that they were giving the deal to they didn't want to take the mm -hmm. money from mm -hmm. their friends with an insurance company yeah. I'd like to ask you some real boring questions the nuts <coughs> and bolts of you're an informant you're telling us of what was going on in the early 1980s what were your meetings like on Monday nights? What time did they start? What time did they end? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have stories? Mm -hmm. Meetings meetings in the early uh, 1980s started at the traditional time, which was 7.30. Uh -huh. uh, meetings were uh, extremely long. We often would not leave until after midnight. Uh, generally. Generally would not That's leave right. until after and midnight. And we may have only gotten halfway yeah. through the agenda. And we may have only gotten halfway through the agenda. And this is weekly. Agenda. Yeah. On a weekly Monday. basis, mm -hmm. uh, we we always took a little bit of a break in the summer for a couple of weeks, but that was about it. Uh, so the meetings were very long, the agendas were extremely packed, and actually that's one thing, as Terry referred to as the shadow government, we could do was jam the agenda with items that we felt needed consideration, even though they might not pass, even though they would receive a little mm -hmm. bit of discussion. Uh, we made an effort to make our agenda. <coughs> be part of the agenda. Did you uh, have pre-meetings before the Monday yes, night meeting? We had meeting? pre meetings that, that were described by the <laughs> press, I believe, as the Mickey Mouse Club and all <laughs> kinds of other assorted things. We would meet every Sunday night at one of our houses we usually rotated around mm -hmm. and uh, talk about the agenda, talk about issues, try to come to a consensus. And we were described by the press as a as as a block. A, a block. Yeah. And that we blind mice. Blind mice. This is the Burlington Free Press, mm -hmm. not the Vanguard, right? right? And uh, it was because we generally did vote as a block, but uh, being a minority group, voting as a block is an extremely good strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, inside of those meetings, we often had extended, long discussions which had uh, disagreement and, and so on and so forth until we could actually get to a consensus point. Yeah. And so there was a tremendous amount of political work that was mm -hmm. going on on those Sunday nights. And in fact, 
in some ways, more political work than it would actually mm -hmm. happen when you were sitting in that, mm -hmm. in that council. We, we didn't always just discuss the agenda, though, because we would, uh, we would also discuss initiatives that were, were in progress that any of us may have been working on individually or someone in the administration may have been working on so that by the time it got to the agenda or into uh, a resolution form, we were all in agreement mm -hmm. before it got mm -hmm. to that point. Those would be three-hour meetings, easy too. I mean, mm -hmm. I can remember going home at 11 o'clock mm -hmm. more, than, more than once, for sure. Is there anything that you all disagreed upon and you went in and you agreed on because you had the Sunday night meeting? Anything that was passed that still leaves mm -hmm. maybe a sour taste or a feeling like, I'm not sure I really wanted to back that, but because of the party? Well, I know Bernie and I had disagreement on the wood chip plant because when I was elected, it wasn't built. Um, the bonds had not been floated yet, although they had been approved by the voters, I think, at that yeah. point. And it was, I think that was the year before I was elected. And I didn't know Bernie before I ran. I, mm -hmm. I met him when I became a candidate. We had a meeting like Rick did and discussed several things. And we were not on agreement on the wood chip plant. And when that item came up on the agenda to approve those bonds, I think you and I were probably the only ones who voted mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. Of our neighborhood. Right. So the reality is that we <coughs> would argue points out on Sunday night meetings, and if we couldn't come to agreement, we didn't come to agreement, and we'd vote our own, our own conscience. I mean, right. we never, nobody was ever had their arm twisted in a way that they felt bad about. I don't believe that's ever happened amongst progressives. It's just that we, we share a, a certain commonality of, of basic principles about what's fair, about empowering people without much power or wealth. And, and so a lot of those principles, you argue them out until you figure out well, what's the best way to carry forward the principles that we basically share? And so in most cases, on the controversial issues, we would come to agreement. But some issues, like, I don't know, like an ordinance on feeding seagulls or whatever, it's like mm -hmm. there's not a, you know, a progressive position on the <laughs> issue, you know? It's like, so we would, you know, people just vote however they choose. But um, the Sunday night meetings were, were very, very important. And I remember somewhere um, where, you know, I... I, I prevailed over Bernie Sanders. I think it was on the issue of the land trust. We'd given some money to the land trust in one year, and Bernie wanted to maybe put some money into a program for down payments for people to buy their own homes. And I said, no, it makes more sense to put it into perpetually affordable housing in the land trust. And we went around and around and around. And finally, Bernie Sanders went along with the majority of and, and backed off his proposal. So we've all had mm -hmm. cases where that's happened with each of us individually. We had an idea, and we argue it. Mm -hmm. And we backed down to some extent. Um, but it's never been where we thought the uh, we voted against what we thought was mm -hmm. a, like right thing to do. I don't. But think do you ever look ever back and think, I think we were too hard on the landlords at the time, or is there any issue that you just feel that maybe we went a little too strong on? And because by the mid '80s, it became more of. mainstream. No. I think progressives <laughs> became more well accepted. Well, well I, I don't. Know, I don't think. I don't think we ever did anything that we felt that way about. But there were things where we would diverge. And like, like they talked about voting against the Woodship Plan, I voted against the Alden Plan for the Waterfront. There were various mm -hmm. times where, where mm -hmm. we just didn't come to agreement. But whenever it was a group vote, I mean, I think we all felt good about our votes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think you have to remember that a lot of the people, and I always said this, when, when I'm screaming and pounding and ranting and raving at the meeting, this is one voice. I'm representing hundreds of people who can't be here tonight mm -hmm. that are feeling twice as angry as me because they're can't, they can't afford their bills, that, what, their utility bills, mm -hmm. or they can't afford the rent that the landlord is slapping up. So, well, I, if, and, and we were five, and at most six in our, at our best stage. And we were looking at seven, eight people um, that absolutely did not agree with us. So I, we had to press our points very hard. And I think we, what we learned over time is, yes, you have to press your point and make it as accurately and as... Um, as determined as possible, but there's also times when you have to go talk to someone too and work that through and try to mm -hmm. get their vote from that, ang that angle too. And I think we got better at that mm -hmm. over time. Um, and that might be the, s the mm -hmm. softening, but the convictions and the, the desire to make something happen in terms of a positive vote. How about the I waterfront? Think, I think that was such a major mm -hmm. issue at the time. I think, partic I'll just finish one, up sure. one point on that. I think, particularly in the early years, um, there's almost nothing that we could look back and, and say we, we, we regret doing that because we did have some philosophical <coughs> ideas such as trying to prevent property taxes from impacting the elderly uh, in mm -hmm. such horrendous ways as they do and continue to do. Mm -hmm. So we, we worked very hard to look for ways inside the city charter 
to change the way in which city services were being paid for such as user fees and so on that would take some of the pressure off the poor property owner so well we, we were forced to implement reappraisal by the state so right. we right. we okay. had to we're looking for so we had to look for these kinds of things and you know when you look back on it if we had had more authority under the charter we would have gone faster and further but we were actually constrained if we had had the and restrained. <laughs> <laughs> we were constrained and restrained and so i don't think uh, i can think i can't think of one thing uh that was a measure that i regret in mm -hmm. fact i think mm -hmm. that uh, we could have gone much further i'd like to add one more thing after every election once a year we would have an all-day retreat we would go someplace leave leave the city it would be all the elected officials, all the administration, any um, advisors or, or key helpers on issues, and we would brainstorm for a solid day and establish a strategy for the year. What were the top issues that we wanted to accomplish? What direction were we going to go in? And then assign those things out, who was going to work on specific issues. So through the year, as things came up, they were it was all things that we knew and things that we all supported in principle, working out the details um, you know, came mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, oh, we so knew one of the things about the going. property tax thing is, is that that we actually got as far as getting items on the ballot to change the city charter to allow the city to give uh, preference to elderly fixed income folks um, to be able to to change the way we collected property tax. And some of them we were successful exemption. homestead exem exemptions, things like that, because we realized that the property tax is probably the most unfair way of taxing people because mm -hmm. it's not based on ability mm -hmm. to pay. And some of them we got through, like uh, business classification, but others. What was it based on at that time? You said it was not based on the ability well, to pay. The, the property tax is not to this day. It never has been based on ability to pay. I mean, somebody who might be only getting Social Security bought the house when it was five thousand dollars many, many, many years so ago. Good. Now it's worth a lot, not because that they have a lot of money, but because of development nearby, and they can't afford to pay the property taxes on the house yeah. and they don't have enough money to do it and they're forced to move. People mm -hmm. literally were forced out of their homes and Absolutely. probably still happening. And, and we tried and, and some of them we got through. Others we actually got approved by the voters on the, on the ballot and then the legislature in Montpelier shot them down because the all way it works, down and only, in the, only the legislature can change the city charter. We, we could pass it, the voters could pass it, but if Montpelier said no, it was no and that mm -hmm. happened. And the, the thing that was so striking about all that property tax stuff is that I can remember saying 42% of the property in Burlington is not taxable. So 58% that is taxable sh has the burden of funding the whole infrastructure of the city. So what, and then so that's when we began the whole diversification. Well, we go after utility bills were paid by the tax exempt properties as well as the people who pay property taxes. And, and the excavation fee. Excavation fee. All these things that up to that point if you were tax exempt, you were exonerated for paying any type of fee to the city. Mm -hmm. and one, of the, one of the big problem areas, of course, when we talk about the the, the other percentage of non-property taxpayers, was the place that I worked at and mm -hmm. still work at is the university. Absolutely. So the university was receiving free city police services when needed, free fire services when needed. Um, they paid obviously for their water, uh, but they didn't pay for the damage that was done to the streets when the water mains had to be dug up, the city, the city taxpayers paid for those things. So while this is very detailed, you can see that the impact of, of, of that much property uh, not on the tax rolls made the taxes no. much higher for everyone else. <laughs> so we worked yeah. very hard at, at those kinds of issues over those early years. You know, and the other thing, I did, as we're talking, I remember is that when we would fight so vigorously for something, Another measure of why we had to do that was that out of some 105 commission seats right. that the city had, we oh. had about two or three. Yep. So we had no what no power whatsoever on all the city departments. Mm -hmm. yeah, you got to talk about the commissions, talking about the early years. <laughs> you know, I mean, to this day, I mean, Burlington is is got a bizarre form of government where everybody assumes the mayor and the city council run the city, but re in reality, the commissions to a large extent do, and the commissions are non-elected. They're appointed by the city council. Um, but uh, they, nobody knows who they are. It's like if you have a problem with the, y you know, the police, you call your city councilor, you call the mayor to complain. Unfortunately, the mayor and city councilor have no authority over the police. It's the yeah. police commissioner who nobody even knows the name of. And, and in those early years, as Gary yeah. said, it's like there was maybe one or two people from the old North End, wards two and three mm -hmm. at most, mm -hmm. and there were a handful of women. It was basically 
upper income white men from the hill section in the new north end and and that's fine those people may have been wonderful people but it was didn't reflect the diversity of the city did you change that gradually over the years and the early years we couldn't because we couldn't get a single commissioner appointed eventually got enough seats finally had six seats in the city council and then with the mayor voting too we were able to have these tie votes and with a tie vote they finally had to right. settle and bargain out uh, seats and so we managed to get commissioners in finally when did we get the sixth seat was that in 1980 when George Tabo won was the mm. sixth seat and I'm not sure which year that was this sort of a blur <laughs> I want to talk about no, the wasn't, waterfront wasn't it when Peter issue when I moved okay. here uh-huh and yeah. where were all of you on the Alden waterfront let, isn't it let me start we're all over the waterfront <laughs> <laughs> let me start with a little of the ancient history about the waterfront not before us but how uh, I started out uh, and maybe some of you don't even know the whole story on this but uh, I was appointed to ordinance committee and ordinance one of the first ideas that we had to protect the waterfront this is way before Alden was to rezone it now the wa waterfront had been zoned pretty much so that private developers as they wished could go in and build anything that they wanted there mm -hmm. uh, right up to the edge uh, except for the land right up <coughs> to the edge of the water uh, with very very little restriction in terms of height or setback or anything so theoretically and actually before we were elected there were proposals for tall spire-like buildings and big convention centers with towers and all of these kinds of things expensive upper income housing these were some of the things that were being floated by developers and I and so we had the idea that we should try to rezone it and uh, Peter Clavel was just at that point uh, this must have been 82 or 83 just at that point had become the director of community and economic development office we rewrote an ordinance which would have restricted public uh, restricted development down there uh, in terms of all of those things so that buildings would be low and, all, and so on and so forth um, we brought that in to a, a committee that was a appointed committee again called the waterfront committee over which we had no power uh. Uh, and uh, we brought it in, and they oh the waterfront uh, advisory board. Water <laughs> advisory board. <laughs> yeah, that was it, right. <laughs> we had no. And yeah. we brought it in together. Uh, <laughs> we brought it in as progressives. Peter and I were the only ones at the meetings, and it was summarily voted down in about 30 seconds mm -hmm. uh, by Republicans and Democrats and the old guard. They just bam, it was dead, mm -hmm. and it never went anywhere. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of our concern and our fight to try to have as much public access and as much um, downscale mm -hmm. kind of very small development people down there. access mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so then it, it started to move yeah. from there and yeah. but see, that, that history is uh, yeah. critical because that was what we were afraid would happen if we weren't able to get something else through now the Alden plan had you know a significant amount of public park space like many times more than had ever been considered by the, mm -hmm. the previous proposals mm -hmm. um, a lot of us didn't think that it was ideal <coughs> but some people Bernie Sanders being one of them felt that if we can't get this development locked in whatever is developed down there is going to be far worse because you see what these guys want they won't even look at their rezoning so it was the fear of what could happen which would be far worse that motivated some of the people to, mm -hmm. to support the Alden plan because compared to all the previous proposals it was like a hundred times better in terms mm -hmm. of park space and and community access and not being an enclave for the rich some of us felt that it still wasn't good enough and that it would have negative impacts and so some of us said no we think we should continue the fight and try and get something even better yet but you have to understand that background of why people thought that you know this is better than we're going to get otherwise and mm -hmm. so that's sort of what some of the motivation when you for say why. some of us you personally well I was one of, I, did, I did not support the Alden plan mm -hmm. um, although I supported certain steps of, of allowing it to come to a vote and so on and that got a lot of attention the neighborhood mm -hmm. planning assemblies mm -hmm. we had had hundreds of people right. at the assemblies mm -hmm. and and it but generally got support throughout the city mm -hmm. um, but there was a yep. small movement of people that wanted just bike paths and um, right. green space. Who was right. the person? I Rick can't Sharp. Think. Yes, Rick oh, Sharp. No, no, he wanted development just on the other side of Lake Street. In fact, uh, he, he wanted the bike path right. and trees, mm -hmm. but he wanted development um, on the other side. Yeah. But there were some people who referred to themselves as Greens, mm -hmm. followers of Marie right. Bookchin and so on, who wanted nothing. They wanted a nature preserve, That's although right. it was know toxic soil because it was all fill land but they still they wanted you know muskrats and so on and that was and more mid space. 80s though I think when they came yeah. in that was a little later yeah. yeah my feeling was that that um, and I supported the Alden plan and I at the time I was chair of the water Aldermanic waterfront committee 
and we had i don't know how many scores of public hearings got as much input as you would want on any public project and they were obviously the developers were sensitive to some of the the requirements of the of the people and what they said and then i had the luxury of visiting with the architects both in burlington and down in boston and visited other waterfronts around the east coast and i said my conclusion was this could be a winner that people in our wards and i think across the city we're going to be able to get down to that waterfront finally and have some fun we're going to get some tax revenues but that wasn't the 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 sole reason for going ahead because where prior it was and that it was a good thing i think you know looking back probably it was too much too quick for people and that burlington i think uh wanted more of an evolution on the waterfront which we're getting i mean i think that's what's happening today but it it was I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. It is. It is interesting, however, that the ordinance that we proposed in the beginning uh, to rezone the waterfront is now passed. And so, by the time it did pass, the, the, the thinking among the Republicans and the Democrats had evolved. And my view is it might not have evolved unless there had been uh, the kind of pressure that we had applied and mm -hmm. the kind of work that we had done consistently mm -hmm. over all of those years. It took a long time. For people to really understand those issues, yeah, and it was such a. It became not a vote for what's the right waterfront, but it became an absolute political decision. And because the progressives were this way, and the Democrats had to be on the other side, and the Republicans were a third view, mm -hmm. it was almost d uh, destined for defeat because of that alone. Mm -hmm. Where I've seen waterfronts and major developments take off, it's not the politicians who are running or orchestrating pro and con. It's it's these uh, citizens groups that mm -hmm. uh, combine, you know, the average citizen, business community, and civic leaders coming together, and not the politicians. Mm -hmm. And it became such a, who is going to win the, the election was based on whether they're pro or con for the waterfront. Mm -hmm. it, it, that hurt, especially when you needed two-thirds of a, mm -hmm. a ballot vote. Yeah. And that, that made it particularly difficult. Now, there were a lot of physical changes on Church Street in the early 1980s. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything to do with that? Well, Downtown I, changing? Actually, not. not mm -hmm. A lot directly because mm -hmm. the bond issue for uh, doing the marketplace had been approved, you know, been knocked down by the voters a couple of times. And the mm -hmm. third time it was finally approved, right before we came into office, and so the construction started right about when we got first came in, mm -hmm. um, and so that was that was an initiative of, mm -hmm. you know, I'll admit, Paquette administration. There were some good things about that, and there were some bad things. How I mean, about the vendors? Did you have anything to do with the oh, number well, of well, vendors? We fought to make sure that the sure. vendor fees Vendors would be affordable and so Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Put a lot of uh, work on that. In fact, I was on the ordinance committee, and we worked hard to, with, with a group of vendors, and our most famous one, of course, our, our hot dog lady, mm -hmm. uh, was the representative. And we made, we made it very clear that, uh, and worked very carefully on what the license fees should be for those, both citywide mm -hmm. and on the marketplace, and worked, worked with them to try to make it fair for everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think we expanded working with the Church Street Marketplace Commission. Also, we expanded the number mm -hmm. that were available. Mm -hmm. A little thing, but an important thing mm -hmm. for the marketplace. Mm -hmm. It may soon, soon go up to $3,000 a year no. to have oh, a cart. No. Wow. It's really? 1000 now. Lois Bodoki, the hot dog lady, we just did her oral history April show. And uh, she's mentioned it may triple. Mm. Mm. So they need some activists for this wow. again, mm. I think. I'm sure that's something the progressives would rather have a raffle or lottery system yeah. for getting on there. Zoe, I'm interested in you a little bit because there weren't too many women in the council at that time. You said there were a few Republican women? Well, there was Sadie and I to begin with, uh -huh. and then the following year, I think Diane Gallagher was oh elected goodness. from Ward 6, and I, I'm not sure if Linda Burns came on at the same no. time or not, or if that was maybe a year later. Mm -hmm. I think a year later. Yeah, that was when, um, I can't remember who, whose seat she was <coughs> uh, Well, one of the funniest things that went on was the debate over what do we call ourselves. Are we older men? Are we older women? Right. And they asked me when I was elected, what do you want on your plate? And I said, well, older woman. Sure, that's all right with me. And when Diane and Linda were elected, they made up their plates, older woman. And they objected. They wanted it changed back to aldermen. And I, the Free Press did a man on the street question. It was in the paper. <laughs> man on the street. Yeah. You know. <laughs> what do you think? You know, should the women on the board be aldermen or alderwomen? And the consensus was, well, whatever they want. And they changed their name place back to aldermen. Jeez. But um, I, I, I didn't have very much in common 
with with the other women on the board certainly not not politically um, it, it was interesting being a woman on the board because it's definitely male dominated mm -hmm. and the whole time mm -hmm. I was there there was never a woman president of the board yes. and I tried a couple of times but mm -hmm. never made it and uh, the first year I was elected I had some problems where Bob Patterson did not recognize me or cut me off or um, there was one issue there was one issue in particular that I wanted to be recognized for, and I had approached him before the meeting and said, when this comes up, make sure you recognize me because I want to address it. And it came up, and he immediately re called on someone else, and the issue was postponed or sent to committee or effectively killed. And I was really upset mm -hmm. because I had approached him to begin with. So I wrote him a letter, and I cited three or four examples <coughs> of what I, what I thought was unfair, not recognizing me. And, oh, there was a big mess in the paper. The Free Press said I was peevish and all this. And, <laughs> and uh, Bob Patterson's explanation was, well, I'm left-handed, and so I always look to that side of the board. <laughs> you know, and the funny thing is, is I was sitting on that side of the board, <laughs> so that excuse didn't fly. But anyway, he, he did become more sensitive to it after that. Mm -hmm. We had some amazing fights. I mean, things like where you sit and so on. I remember the oh, yeah. one year uh, we wanted... Mayor Sanders' table to be next to the city council table, so we could, so he could be sort of part of the discussion. Um, but they they wanted Democrats and Republicans wanted him to sit on this table, sort of behind the city council, so we right. couldn't make eye contact. Right. Mm -hmm. And we had this whole fight about where the mayor should be allowed to sit. And then there's other times about whether he would, should even be allowed to speak mm -hmm. at the meetings. Right. I remember when when Alan Gear right. was first elected president, the first meeting mm -hmm. he was he presided over, um, he he endeavored to not let Mayor Sanders speak at all. He said, this is a meeting of city council, you can't talk. Even if it was an a, a agenda item put on by Mayor Sanders, right. he put on the agenda, he wanted to explain it, he wouldn't be recognized. Well, well he know, pushed the that, button that, to turn off his microphone. Right. We finally stormed, yeah. we walked out of one of those right. meetings. Before you guys came that night, I, w I got there early, and Bernie's desk was moved to the back. Yes. And I went about putting it back there, and Alan Gear lost it. He was absolutely, f how could you overrule me as president of this board? I said, I'm sorry. I sat on the table. I said, you're going to have to move me with the table if you want this back there. It's absolutely wrong. And we went through this big thing, and then people started coming into the room, and it was too embarrassing for him to continue this tirade to pull it back behind. But it was absurd. Seating yeah, around absolutely. the table was, was an interesting Jeez. power play. The president of the board appointed all committees as well as where you sat on the board. And there was... Uh, just this image thing that whoever sat closest to the president of the board mm. was more powerful oh. or had higher rank. And the further you were out on the horseshoe, well, yeah, the, less, mm -hmm. the, less, the, the less the less that you less that you were. <laughs> it, it was pretty. Needless funny. to say, we were on the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were. On were. either end, you know. That's why I here. asked you about your ages. It sounds so much like the '60s to me. Yeah. This abrasiveness, this sort of questioning authority, and I mean, I'm. I'm sensing there wasn't a lot of PR even on your part as far as like let's let's try to get along with these guys. Yeah, uh, a little bit. We're we're tired of this, and yeah. mm -hmm. maybe rightfully so. But uh, let me say that there were attempts to made, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that there were attempts at the negotiation level and at the PR level. Um, when we, when it came up to electing the commissioners, and it, when it came up to uh, us being appointed to our various committees, like the all, like the ordinance committee and so on and so forth, there was always a some horse trading going on to get votes. So we would vote for this, they would vote for that. And there was always a negotiator that was right. appointed from each group. So there was usually a Democratic, a Republican, and a progressive negotiator. Mm -hmm. I was a negotiator one year. Uh, yeah. And we just sat in the room and said, well, okay, ordinance committee, who do you want on that? Finance committee, who do you want on that? And it went back and forth and back and forth. And in those early years, we had so little power that we usually ended up fairly much on the, on the unpreferred committees, mm -hmm. the committees that had very little influence, the committees that had very little power, and the committees that really weren't going to affect changes. Um, so even though we worked hard at negotiating, the, the coalition of the, what we sometimes call the Republicrats, or the Democans, mm -hmm. was really and truly a coalition. And they stuck together, and they... Mm -hmm. were as much of the fight as we were of the fight. Absolutely. And then things started, as we got more and more experience, things started to change. For example, President Gere would often, or maybe he wasn't the president that year, he would often come with us on certain issues, and mm -hmm. then other people would come with us on certain issues. So I think that we were 
more experienced politically, and they were also seeing that we yes. weren't the evil empire. Mm -hmm. And also, we really did have for the long idea. haul. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was there any attempt to invite some of these people to your parties? I mean, Absolutely. sometimes when you get to know them as people, mm -hmm. do you know what I'm saying? We, yeah, I can remember my house. In fact, so we had, we had uh, I remember that when Leopold was treasurer and so on, oh, yeah. we had parties there, and there were a lot of folks that would come from various different yeah. parties. So, yeah, we, we did interact with them socially. It was not like we were, except I should say, the very first year or two, it was not like that. It, mm -hmm. was, it, was, it was siege. I mean, they were refusing the mayor to have a secretary. They were refusing any of his appointments. And it was, it was like, they referred to us as fungus. It was like, it was, it was war. I mean, there was, it was a siege mentality in the mayor's office. Like, they had to be careful about what they would say for fear that there might be, you know, wiretapping of, uh, by, the, by the Democrats, that Bernie Sanders' mail was opened illegally by Frank Wagner, the city clerk, and he was finally reprimanded and, and given a, a sus suspension uh, by the city council because, you know, it was just outrageous stuff happening. It was mm -hmm. a very siege mentality. It's true that eventually, once they realized, especially once Bernie Sanders got reelected, that was what they said, okay, we got to work with the guy. Mm -hmm. And that's when things became calmer. They no longer had that stone wall of we're not gonna we're not gonna let this guy be mayor. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was definitely a two two sided war. After that, there was much more um, you know com camaraderie mm -hmm. and 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 some joking and some some good some, feelings with various yeah. members. But the first two years, yeah. uh, no, it was it was, it was pretty brutal. it was brutal. And, you know, going back to the women's issue, I, Sadie, being from Ward Three too, we would talk a lot, and it was, it was just too much. The anger and the, the uh, emotions around different issues was just overwhelming for her. Mm -hmm. And she had been in the legislature eight terms, I guess, uh, up to that point, and never experienced anything that was so, um, I don't know, angry and emotional and, and negative. And she, she really, she was a master of one lines. And she still is the master of one lines, mm -hmm. but it, it just it pained her to go into these fierce fights. It was a very male dominant type of uh, of a arena. And I think it just you had to really have your uh, mm -hmm. fists on the table and ready to go. What was it like on the street? You were telling me what's happening in your personal meetings and at the alderman meetings. What was it like when you you left city hall and you're on the street? You go to a restaurant. Do people tell you things? Mm -hmm. uh, it was Do you great. Remember of those days? <laughs> it was great. Lots of phone calls we had at home. A lot of support. A lot of support. Mm -hmm. The people in, in our parts of town, man, they just couldn't thank us enough for what we were doing for them. Mm -hmm. and fun, finally, people were standing up and, and saying what they had felt for years that you could beat City Hall, that we were City Hall. And it was a wonderful thing. The but citizen involvement in government in Burlington just blossomed after 81, 82. It was. Um, it had been this very small, tight click of family, a few families that ran Burlington government to a very large degree, and suddenly we had all kinds of citizen uh, volunteer committees that were established for, you know, like I mentioned, the youth program, the arts, uh, mm -hmm. women's programs, um, and and people were involved in d helping decide how the community development block grant money, uh, which we get from the federal government, should be distributed. The neighborhood assemblies, we created those neighborhood assemblies. Uh, I sponsored a resolution, got support from the planning commission even. And, and we created neighborhood meetings that, w that are still ongoing today. I mean, they're not big, beautiful uh -huh. you know, models of, of great democracy because they are pretty small. But, but, th but in those days, there was a lot of participation. And sometimes there still is in some of the neighborhoods. And, and the number of people, the sheer number of people involved in, in input and decision making in the city, I would say more than quintupled. I mean, it was just a dramatic growth of involvement. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people felt. They, they were, I remember there was a pollster that did a, or a business pollster, and they were doing a poll for some, one of the other candidates in some election. And, and one of the questions said, do you know who your, your, your alderman is, your city councilor is? Do you know which ward you mm -hmm. live in? And they had, they had done polling all over the country for different political parties. They had never seen a city where so many people <coughs> knew what ward number they were in and who their city councilor was. They, the level of political involvement and interest and knowledge in Burlington just blew them away. They had never seen anything like that. Yeah. Because it's a college town, do you think no, it's no, because of the students? No, no, it's nothing to do with the college. Oh, no, it's just no. regular it folks. At all. No, it was actually, university students have never played a, a significant yeah. role um, in municipal elections in Burlington. Um, there was the year that the Democrats and on the, on the uh, Republicans on the voter board tried to deny students the right to vote by saying they'd have to come down to a special meeting and you know give them extra hoops to jump through, and we challenged them in court and got them to back down, but. 
by and large, students have not played a role in, in Burlington's progressive mm -hmm. history uh, in a major way. It's been the neighborhood, the mm -hmm. neighborhoods. I think another interesting story. I think mm -hmm. another aspect of, of thinking about uh, what it was like on the streets is to talk for each of us to talk a little, just very briefly about how it felt in the ward. Um, I come from Ward One, which was largely a student ward of the hospital, the university, and then kind of a growing student population among the old Victorian homes. So we did did things to try to change this thing of people parking on the uh, on people's lawns and uh, get some of the cars off the streets where it was much too crowded and. Uh, we got the sidewalk program going citywide. We got the tree planting program. Mm. And one of the neatest things that I can recollect is just walking down the street and somebody would wave their hand and say, hey, Rick, thanks a lot for getting my sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Now, that's called, uh, in, in common parlance, sewer socialism. <laughs> but I mean, p taking care of a neighborhood and an environment isn't sewer socialism for me. Mm. It's, it's bringing government to the people to fix things that are broken, to mm -hmm. get the, give them the services that they needed. It's quality of life. It's really. a quality of life mm -hmm. issue, and I think that, that that's uh, something that I really felt over those four years mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. my neighborhood. Well, for Gary and I, we worked pretty closely on the Old North End Development Committee, mm -hmm. and we had a chunk of money out of community development block grants, which came from the federal government. And we put together a program. We wanted to try to revitalize North Street and return it. It used to be once a very thriving uh, business district. and it had been neglected for years and years and years. And of course, there was no way we were going to turn that around immediately. But we developed a program to uh, try to get businesses to improve the looks of their, their facades by offering um, paint and materials to uh, repair their buildings. And we also worked to change the zoning to preserve um, the residential character. We changed it to neighborhood commercial so it would preserve residential character while allowing small businesses to, to move into some of the vacant storefronts. And that was very hard work. We worked with the community development office pretty hard to try to attract new businesses. We attracted a locksmith, a pharmacy. Uh, we Burlington College. Burlington College. We surveyed the neighbors in the area to see what they wanted, you know, a pharmacy, a bank branch, which we were never able to Still negotiate to <laughs> up Great there. Name. But uh, well, service, yeah. services like that, um, that we that we worked very hard on trying to improve, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the the Heritage Festival mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. North Street, tried mm -hmm. to uh, develop a sense of community around what was the old North End's downtown. And, and the other thing that we, you did very effectively and I worked on was getting rid of all the, or decreasing the number of bars. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's way, way down now. Mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. only two or three. Right. When, when before it was just a street full of bars. See, that's one of the things that, yeah. that uh, historically is often misrepresented about the progressives. I mean, 95, 99% of our time was spent on things that are just basic uh, quality of life issues around the neighborhoods, around <coughs> tree planting programs. I mean, Burlington gets all kinds of awards from uh, Arbor societies mm -hmm. and so on for, for, for the reforestation program, um, the sidewalk plowing, the street repaving, the basic stuff like that. But we also would ch would challenge the federal government on priorities, like when they sent down the rules saying, in case of nuclear attack, Burlington should uh, mm. evacuate to St. Albans. This is their plan. <laughs> And they were going to they were going to tie certain money to these things, and you you're going to have to make plans for doing that. So we offered a resolution saying we refuse to make plans for the death of the planet and how we're going to go to St. Albans to save ourselves in case of nuclear war. We're not going to spend money planning how to evacuate Burlington to St. Yeah. Albans. Mm -hmm. And so we challenged the federal government on a lot of things around um, issues of nuclear war, as mm -hmm. Zoe mentioned, but also. Um, uh, priorities on the federal budget with Reagan cutting this and cutting that, we, we would offer resolutions. And also on some international issues. I think the invasion of Grenada by the United States military was debated for more time mm. on the Burlington City Council, all of two hours, than got debated in U.S. Congress. So Terry, mm -hmm. a lot of people disagreed with that. That why is the council talking about national issues? We're, we're, we have you here to talk about our local issues. I know we only have a few more minutes. That's like a loaded. Well, the reality comment. is, as I can so. say, less than less than one tenth of one percent of our time was spent on those things. But some of those things were just dire issues that our constituents said to us. Our our federal leaders are ignoring us on this issue. We need a voice. We need to have media attention and public attention brought to some of these uh, issues of life and death for nuclear mm -hmm. war. 
and uh, things like that. And well, those issues did affect us mm -hmm. financially as well. One percent of your time. Much less. Okay. So I think there's a misconception there. Most yeah. people think that you spent a lot of time on this. That's because that's whenever we did have one of those items. Um, you know, you the a couple times a year, there would there would be publicity about it, and the opponents mm -hmm. because they didn't want to. They didn't want to say, no, we want nuclear war. Okay. They would say, no, we don't think we should talk about this. We want um, Ronald Reagan to lead us on this issue. Uh -huh. And we say, we don't trust Ronald Reagan's leadership on this no. issue. It's Real like, quickly, I'm yeah. sorry, we only have mm -hmm. like two minutes left. Um, you were Citizens Party, Independence. When, when did Progressive Coalition, when did, when did that title you come know, into being? I guess I, I want to just have it on I, tape. <laughs> I can remember, we were after one of those wonderful meetings, it was 1, 12, 30, when we were in... Uh, B.T. McGuire's, B. probably. B.T. McGuire's, and talking, <laughs> eating, or dinner, finally. And I think we gelled on Progressive Coalition that night. About what year, do you think? Uh, it was probably 84. 83. 83. 83. Yeah. See, you'll never get it, because it's like, it wasn't like a formal decision ever. It just never. Like, yeah. We just sort of started referring we to ourselves that way. We were a coalition See, we of were being called Sanderistas I want to thank all of you for being <laughs> here. We have to go real soon. And I, what I want to say, if I do have a few seconds, is Walter Cronkite signed off the air the, that week that Bernie Sanders was elected. I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> a little Great. tidbit. Nice. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. Great fun.